Hey, welcome to St Swithin's Online Midweek. My name's Jim, I'm the vicar here, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, we're missing seeing you all in person, but hope you're managing to find ways to connect in. In this midweek's session, we've been really struck again and challenged again by that verse from Micah 6 verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? That you act justly, love mercy and walk humbly. You know, in the whole area of racial injustice, there's been so much in the media recently and it's been deeply challenging. I said on Sunday that to not step up or step out is by definition to step back. And so we want to go on a bit of a journey looking at how can we be a church that sees his kingdom come, not just through people coming to Christ, not just through blessing our, our, our kind of neighbourhoods, through service, but what does it mean to be a church who looks and stands up for and speaks out uh, into areas of injustice? And so this, this session, I'm going to be interviewing a good friend, Connie St. Louis. I'll let her introduce herself in just a few moments. But we, we want to begin to unpick some of those things about racial injustice and how we as a church can respond. Uh, Josh has also written a song which we're going to be pray, uh, playing after the interview uh, with some words up there from the Psalms to help you reflect on all you hear in the interview uh, and just take some time to pray uh, and to come before God and give this situation and others to him. So we hope, uh, I was going to say enjoy uh, this session, maybe enjoy is the wrong word, but we hope you find this session useful. We hope it challenges you. Uh, we hope there's a response. And we look forward to carrying on this conversation in the days, weeks and months ahead as we work out what does it mean to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. What does it mean to see his kingdom come here uh, in Lincoln and the surrounding areas as it is in heaven? God bless. Um, do keep connecting. Do keep plugging in. Uh, we will see you on Sunday at 10.30 and 6.30 on the online platform, YouTube or Facebook Live. God bless. Have a great rest of the My name's Connie St. Louis. Um, I'm a journalist, um, uh, now working freelance, formerly for the BBC, and I taught journalism for many years at a university in London. Um, I'm also a Christian, and um, that informs a lot of the things I do uh, because I come from a place of believing in social action and oh. justice. Brilliant. And uh, we, we've known you for a few years now, Colin, which is... Uh, you, which has been wonderful from my lovely. point of view. <laughs> you, you've been like a surrogate, I don't know what the word is, grandmother, godmother. <laughs> yeah, grandma, yeah. Friend, you know, to our family as well. Yeah, just great. love you guys and happy to have this conversation with you as well. I know, it's, it's yeah. really yeah. appreciate it and then... Um, I, I must admit, I was slightly nervous about having it. Although, no, Connie, I don't know we've had a few of these conversations off, you know, offline and as I, well. I, I, I think this is a very nerve-wracking moment, and um, I, I think first of all, I will, let me start. Mm. Actually, well, not saying what I think, but just thank you for your Instagram post um, because that was a brave Instagram post, and. Um, I love the fact that you're prepared to acknowledge where you are. I love the fact that you acknowledge your white male privilege. Yep. Um, and I love the fact that you're there seeking answers and, and not being ref reflexive or defensive about this moment and having the conversations. And so um, that those I think are just the great places to start. You can't start anywhere trying to solve something unless you acknowledge that it's something that needs to be solved. Um, so I think that's been really really powerful from my point of view to watch this whole process because um i think if you as old as i am you see my gray hair uh the trouble is is that you start to become historically cynical yeah. uh, you know i've been around a long time i've been doing race issues as a journalist uh as a christian for a long time mm. and you seem to think nothing is going to change so i find it quite inspiring when people particularly white people recognize that this is a problem and their own fragility within recognizing the problem. And as just I always say, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, just, just to push that back on that. Well, not push back, but just to kind of reflect on that, that process of posting for me. There's a, there's a sense in which you, you feel like you want to say something, you have to say something. I can't, I can't you know, because silence essentially is, you know, it's not a neutral act, is it? It's, no. 
but, but, but equally, um, you know, this, this thing about white fragility and um, not wanting to say the wrong thing or get it wrong or get you, because you don't want to put yourself, I guess, essentially reflect above the parapet, which is a, so, so there's quite a lot of that wrestling going on. But also, I'm also aware it's dead easy, if you like, to just, you know, the cost of an Instagram post in some ways isn't, isn't huge. Um, and it feels quite empty. Um, and I think doing something is always better than doing nothing. Yeah. And I suppose my challenge to you as a friend is what next? Yeah. And yeah. so I've, I've been very clear about this. There are two stances I have taken in this. One of them is that um, don't come to me to ask me to educate you about race. Go and do your homework and yeah. I will yeah. have that conversation, which is very much a book by Rene Edo Lodges. Um, I'm not talking to white people about race anymore. Just because I, I would have a long line of people outside my door thinking and asking me lots of what I call banal questions about sure. race. Yeah, yeah. Um, so do your education. But I think right at this moment, I think it's, there's a call to action. And I can't remember how many call to actions I have lived through. Mm. Stephen Lawrence, you know, it's a long time ago. Um, uh, a young man that was killed in London That's over it. 20 odd years ago. I'll just give some context for the young. Um, and so many call to actions, so many reports, so many investigations. And I just think we are beyond all of that now. We're beyond the fact that there is racism. We are beyond the fact that something needs to be done. And so I'm just interested in essentially jim what are you going to do about it and and i say that not to put you on the spot so no, no, no. come up with anything but just so that i i i don't want to be able to sit here another in another year and somebody has forgotten uh, george floyd's name because he was name will be forgotten i had a conversation with a, a really uh, close neighbor friend of mine who's also christian who, who didn't even remember the eric garner i can't breathe meme yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I just think that was such a short time ago. Why don't you remember that? Why do you think this is the first time you've heard this? Why do you think that um, black people keep being killed and are dying in this way all the time? And it's because it peaks the news and then it drops out again. So in my sense, it's a kind of call to action about what are we going to do? I'm not interested in people saying it's really awful what's going on in America because it is really awful what's sure. going, on, going on in America. America is a much more overtly racist society than the UK, much more. And so in lots of ways, we can get away with pointing our finger at them because it is quite fearful to see the number of people they kill. But actually, our society is just as racist. It's just much, much, much more, more, more um, hidden and covert. And think, actually, sorry? sorry? No, sorry. Do, do you think, so in, in Britain, particularly around some of the narrative that kind of around some of the Brexit stuff and um, almost what that gave permission for people to say because of some of the stuff politicians were saying and then people take, do you think Britain has become more overtly racist? Was that just my perception from my white echo chamber? Um, do you know what I mean? Is that, or yeah, is and, it's just the reality and we're just picking up on what's been the reality for years or is there a sense in which it's become more overt racist recently? Uh, I do think um, the the UK has become much more overtly racist and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing and I think the Brexit was the great the great um, dice that was thrown into the into the game to make that happen and um, if you look at if you followed any of that whole narrative around how we got to where we got to there was a very measured move by some very senior people to say actually we can win this if we divide this country. And I think we do have a situation of great division in this country now. Mm -hmm. And and I think what's really interesting is that the way that immigration was used was really, really toxic. And a, a lot of it wasn't really about immigration because we don't have masses of immigration coming into this country. What we had was white 
British people not getting jobs which other people from Europe had taken yeah. and I think that became a much bigger problem for, for people and I think the Brexit dice when it was thrown and loaded in the way that it was just essentially caused this whole thing to splinter so yeah I do think it's a very toxic narrative and one that is going to keep building and building and building and 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 we will come out of Europe, and we will, you know, deal with the consequences of that. Really, mm. yeah. Mm. And I, I was watching just back to your point about, um, yeah, this is the this this sense of a moment, and it's almost like enough talking. Let's let's just do. And I, I was, Ben Lindsay was doing a. We talked about it, didn't we, on on YouTube the other night, and um, he, he was he was expressing something of a sense of almost a Kairos, I mean, I don't think you quite put it in those terms, but a Kairos moment that he's never quite seen the swell of uh, kind of, I don't know, feeling or uh, I wouldn't quite say empathy because that's that's a massive term, but is, is that something you sense? Or is it just there's a media hype around it and it's so easy to post on Instagram, like we were saying, or is there something about this being a, a moment, do you think, or potentially a moment? And I think potentially it is a moment and I think it's a very interesting moment when we're all meant to be social distancing that people sure. are coming together to march. And I think Ben is young um, uh, than I am. And so he hasn't seen some of the other moments. Sure. Um, because I would have said in my, in my youth, young, it was definitely going to be the Stephen Lawrence moment that sure. we were going to... Um, um, coalesce around and get some action and we did get some action but not a great deal of action so I think Ben Lindsay's right I think this is the time but I think I think it's a particular time for the church because I think the church is in a real muddle about race and this is the moment when it can actually do something about it so whilst I think most most politicians are happy to say we condemn what's gone on over in America because it's it's always very easy to do what we are doing and we do it quite a lot and we say look at America goodness they have a problem with race without checking your own um, house and seeing what what that's like and 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 to cast your gaze over to, over over the overseas it's really easy to do yeah. um, and I think it's really important to think really carefully about what we can do here at this present moment and so I do think they talk about it being a 68 moment um, with the, you know, the big Martin Luther King yeah. um, marches and stuff and I think so and they talk about it being a young people's moment and I think yes 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 to all of that but actually I think people like me who are sitting around, who have been sitting around for a long time looking and thinking about this, need to think, what are we going to do? I want a call to action. I don't want any more people feeling sorry, I, uh, people weeping, people coming and telling me how sad they are about what's going on and how shocked they are. I don't want it. I want to see action now. And that makes me sound quite militant, uh, probably. Uh -huh. and, uh, but actually... I'm tired. I'm tired of people. I'm tired of people's other feelings of other. I just think, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, and so the letter that I'm constructing at the moment uh, to my church leaders is about what are you going to do now? Enough talking, enough talking. Um, and, and that's what I want people to think about. And some of it, it's not obvious what to do. I don't think. Um, in the structures that we've built up um, in our society as well in our as well in our churches it's not obvious but we have enough experience mm. of trying to think about how to change society we have enough people out there who've done some thinking about this to to start to call on it and and so i think it's really important that that's what where we start not this sort of recriminatory stuff not that oh isn't this really shocking oh you yeah. poor black people you it's really sad it's 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 not enough um so let, let me just spool back a couple of seconds i'll let, I'll let you get in because i know no, I no, no, it's great, it's great. <laughs> um so look at let's look at uh, the covid19 crisis yes. and it we all are sent into our homes and there are an awful lot of benefits that we suddenly saw as a church to having church at home that sure. people felt they could join in more. Yeah. And, 
and I just think why is it why you know and then people keep talking about wanting to get back into their churches and of course we need to get back into our church of course we need to have communal worship mm. but of course we need to also remember how powerful it was to be a church online and why is it so easy for people to visit church online well it's because it's so much easier than walking into a yeah church of people that look like you that are not greeting you that are not talking to you uh and all the rest of it and 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 so often i i, I don't get this when i um when i visit a church that i don't know if i'm away people just don't talk people don't even say hello and i just think it's extraordinary this is extraordinary you know this is so basic i know it's not it's not the way you you do church at all but I can walk into church and walk out as a, as a visitor yeah. uh, somewhere else and nobody will talk to me. And I just think, but this is the, this is, this, this organization exists for people like me. They don't know if I'm a Christian or not, who are coming in from nowhere. You know, it exists for me, a non-member of this church. Now I happen to be a Christian and it's fine and I can handle it and I can go in and I can worship and find God, but I can walk out of there without any interaction and and no wonder online church is popular because yeah, right, right. I, I don't have to deal with that uh, and so that becomes really quite important and i think the second thing that online churches also should also make people think about is the optics of church sure. and so who's at the front who's speaking who who is um where does the narrative of who we are uh, you know how encompassing is that narrative and and that that's that once you suddenly put something on a television that yeah. becomes really important and it's not just about representation which people talk about in my community and so they think let's get as many black faces online on the screen as possible it's not about that um it, that's a game that's a tick box oh, yeah, yeah. um it's about how you change the thinking the dna of a church for it to become more reflective of of a um of a society really so let me go back to the covid19 thing where i started it became very clear to me um very early on that there was a huge disproportionate representation yeah. of black and asian people dying and I did that because I, I saw it very quickly because one of the things I decided to do with the lockdown um, was because I have a lot of members of my family, I have a very large family in the Midlands who are shielding, yeah. who are who sit, like myself, we have to shield. And I just thought, let me just reach out to those people and anybody else. So I opened a Zoom call every night to get people to talk about stuff um we could laugh we could sting we could do whatever we like and um suddenly i'm on this call after a couple of days and people are telling me that people we knew as children that we were at school with or locally from our parents were dying yeah i was thinking now what are the chances of 66 million people that i could know so many people yeah. who are dying? and then neighbors and then and suddenly i suddenly thought there's a problem here there's not because i think i'm some example of anything but i could just suddenly see in my community there was a problem and then of course the doctors started to die and they were all black or brown people yeah. and what was what was the church's response to that it took ages it took ages and actually there was there was a justice problem here mm. a lot of those people were doctors or nurses or care workers or essential workers key people in our community that had to keep going working they weren't getting the right equipment and we sh people should have been talking about that people should have but it took so ages for people to work out there was a problem and even when there was a problem what do we and i go to a white majority church mm. like church it's a white majority evangelical church what do we do as a church to reach out to the black majority churches where this is having a huge impact yeah what do yeah. we do There's, there was a response that we needed to make but we had to know there was a problem and then we had to work out actually 
we need to move in together. We need to lock into these guys and see what support they can. There's a part of the church that's hurting big time, yeah. part of the church that's bleeding. I don't know anybody in the church that I go to who is not black or brown who has not been impacted by that. It's quite a thing to be able to say. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we don't, we don't have huge numbers of black or brown people in our church, but enough people have been impacted for it to be an issue. And so... How do you, as a leader, you know, this is my question, start to think about those issues when you're not on a family, Midlands, Black, Afro-Caribbean family call, when you're not, you know, you're not, you're not me, you're not sort of feeling those things out. You've got to have enough people around you whose who's job is not just to inform you about Black issues, mm. but enough people that are saying, well, you know, this is happening. And what can we, how can we respond to this? Or, you know, what, what we, you know, what we can be doing really. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, and I, and I do think about you in Lincoln, a church I've been to many times, I love going to, you know, how do you get your pulse on a more diverse um, narrative to inform your church? Because one of the things you have to do is, not just have people that are there talking mm. about it it's a way it's a, it's it's a different you have to breathe a different air you have to be in a different echo chamber if you like yeah yeah and, and how you do that is really really difficult because um you know the people that you naturally know and the people that you've naturally trained with are like you and that's not it's not a criticism the people i naturally know are slightly different to me because I've been a minority in my in my in my career. So I've had to have a broader range of people. And I expect you to hire people in your own image because frankly, if I get a chance to hire a black woman into many posts that I'm that's what I would do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did do that. I did that deliberately sometimes in the BBC. I would hire people in that so that I could make a difference to the the employment um, statistics and profiles of, of that in it. Of course, they could do the job. Of course, the people you hire are going to do the job. But how do we, how do we do something about the sort of DNA of how we think as a church, and how we include things? And I think, of, I think, of, I think back um, to my old church I used to go to, where, where you were part of uh, as a curate, and the women, the black people had particular roles. They were the carers, they were the cleaners, they were yeah, the cooks. Yeah. Um, very few of them spoke at the front. Very few of them led prayers. Very, uh, hardly any of them preached. Uh, um, they were too nervous to, or didn't feel that they had the skill set and nobody helped them to develop the skill set. Yeah. Or some of them were very much more, um, we don't think women should preach. That's kind of yeah, which is fine. Yeah. They they can think that we need all sorts. Um, but how do we? Do, you know, what do we do in terms of turning that whole thing on its head to get a different, a different look of a church, really? Mm. Um, and then also, don't not put too much pressure on the people that are in the church to be everything. You yeah, know, yeah. Nice sort of thing. I mean, I mean, just for the early, uh, not even th- thoughts, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare call thoughts, but um, um, things just reflecting around some of that and in answer to your question, yeah, what do we do about it? Uh, when you, before we had this conversation, Connie, you, you emailed me some thoughts and a poem that you've written and, and then you made a comment on text that I, I was slightly slow getting back to you, which is people who know me just know standard. Um, 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 <laughs> you made the comment, you know, happy not to have this conversation if it's too out there, what you'd written was too out there. And I think I, I was quite taken aback by that in some ways in that what you'd written, I, I didn't feel, uh, you know, I thought it was very measured. I, I thought <laughs> a whole, whole lot more out there you could have gone. And, yeah. and so the fact, and for you, obviously, you don't perceive what you wrote as out there, but no. clearly you, you've got this, almost well it's the white fragility thing i guess again it, yeah it is yeah. what i'm saying so i guess part of my question thinking this through and having these how do we get to a place where we have these conversations in our churches and with people of color and in, in such a way that that white fragility thing, how do we 
I, I guess some of that's relinquishing our white privilege or white power. Mm. Um, and, but you, you know, for you, you, you must just be so tired of kind of having these conversations, but, but working around that white fragility the whole time. And that must also be immensely frustrating. I don't know. Or, uh, and, and then the other bit really to all that is, you know, you wrote in one of your poems, don't ask me to be your teacher in the classroom of race, which you alluded to earlier. And um, something Dr. Elizabeth Henry said the other day, mm. uh, there's something deeply perverse in expecting those oppressed and excluded to be the architects of eliminating that oppression and exclusion. And when she yeah. said that, I was like, wow. Um, and, and, and so important because you know what? And there are several reasons Jim, why I find the time for you. I find the time for you because I love your family. Uh, you, we have a long history together, but you're also, in my mind, what I think a key strategic person. If I can spend some time with you as a white privileged male, I can make a bigger change than by talking to um, auntie so-and-so, my Nigerian friend in a cafe, I can make a bigger strategic change. And I think um, uh, Elizabeth Henry is right. We need to be really much more strategic because the power does not lie with me. The uh. power lies with you. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Uh, no. That's the way our is built up. And so if I can get you to get this and then put my hand in the small of your back and support you a little, I can make a much bigger change in our society than me banging on a bit. Because they'll just say, there she goes again. We know what she's going to say. Um, and actually my constituency, the people that I'm talking to, unless I'm publishing, which I am publishing, I, you know, I publish on, on the net and, and Medium and, and, and other places. So I'm fortunate in that I can, because uh, I'm a journalist, I can get a slightly bigger voice. Um, otherwise, it's, it's just my own little echo chamber or me talking to Ben Lindsay, talking to Andrew Red. You know, we just all talk to each other sure. and we know that it's a problem. And so in, my investment is much more strategic now. And so I'm, I'm really happy to have a conversation, not, not that I'm not going to talk to a young black person who's not interested in who doesn't need my support. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm not like that. I am going to get this on time, but I, I do think about how do we make a change that is really key here. And, and that is by investing it in my time more in the people with the power. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I don't, I don't feel that we have a power relationship in our, in our friendship, in our relationship, not at all. I feel we have a, a very equal and good, strong friendship. But I do think to myself, you can do, so many more people are going to listen to you than they are going to listen to me. That doesn't mean that my voice is, it should be silenced and that I should not be heard. But I also have to recognise that if you're standing in a pub in Lincoln telling somebody we need to, to, to do this with regard to race, they are much more likely to hear you than if I'm standing in that pub with them and they're just thinking, what is that weird black woman doing in this pub anyway? Or, or something like that. So um, I think that's really important. I think in your, in your fragility, and I do think there is a white fragility around this because there's a guilt, a huge guilt. Yeah. Which to get past uh then but you have to also recognize your power in this yep. situation as well and i um and and i think so you come out of a position of feeling very very powerful in this uh, and then thinking let's let's just go for this let's just go for this um and some of it somebody some people will push you back on because that's what people are like but i also think it's really important for you to um to to, to fail to try is just not an option you have to try really because um that's kind of where where the future is i mean i would have loved i mean boris johnson um to make a comment that didn't just say we're really shocked by what's going on in america yeah, yeah. Um, which, and and which really tragic about george floyd i would love boris johnson to say because I think actually leaders should should admit when they've made mistakes as well. Is that we didn't get it right for the um, uh, the B A M E people. I hate that acronym. Uh, who 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 have died? Mm. We did. We. It's okay to say you did something wrong. It's okay to say sorry and then work out how you go forward. Um, Is that part of what you mean by the relinquishment of power? Is yeah. Yeah. It doesn't need. 
I mean, grand gestures are great, but it's it's actually much more in the 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 everyday the because that's what changes the culture, isn't it? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 just by saying we didn't get this right, I want to try and get it right. I don't quite fully understand how to get it right, but my determination is that people won't die because they didn't have the right face masks and gloves and, and, and stuff and being able to put your hand up and say, I made a mistake. Actually, I didn't realize that there were so many people that, that were working in the NHS that were black and brown. You can say that if you like. Um, I wonder why you don't know that if you're a politician, but um, just being able to say, I'm going to do something and I, I've done, I've haven't done it right in the past is I think such a powerful position to stand up from, yeah. and then to be able to say, I may this may not be the entire thing, might not be the entire answer, but actually, um, the problem is I can't work out what else to do apart from to take one step or to take five other steps, you know, yeah. and not just to do one thing and then work that through, but just set a few, a few things in motion and be able to powerfully evaluate what's going on. And I think that's really key. And I think also you don't give the black people the black stuff to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Because um, that's always marginalizing, you know, and so, uh, whenever i've been given the race thing to do i've always said to the people who are sponsoring me particularly in the bbc i'm not doing this unless i partner with you so you want me to do this job whatever the job was within the b but actually it is you and i so i get the fact that you need a gopher you need a specialist yeah, yeah. To go and do the stuff and to set it up and to think about it and all the rest of it but actually what i'm saying to you is this is your lead your lead and so um i i suppose one of the things i would i would say to you is don't don't um put it down to the black or the women or the you know whatever it is you in a sense you have to hold the authority you can't do everything in a church and i'm not asking you to do everything but you have to hold what's really important that you need to make a change in because by saying oh let's get the diversity person to do this or the woman to do this or the disabled to do this you you relinquish the power of how in have the perception of its importance yes. so in order, to, yes. in order to tell the people around you how important something is you have to hold it in a way and not hive it off into committees or yeah. other people who are voluntary and stuff. So you have to give it uh, as much weight as everything else and and i think i was thinking about this letter that i'm writing at the moment about how to say things so you know we took we, you, you had this comment about i always feel like I'm, I'm out there and i do feel like i'm out there i write a poem that people come and tell me is so out there so brave and all the way and i'm thinking really yeah. <laughs> you don't know what i could have written and then they come and they'll tell me perhaps connie you need a bit more um, forgiveness as well and i'm thinking actually i think you need a bit more repentance but i'm not going yeah. to say that. i'm going to just behave myself and not be uh i want to set myself in op opposition to you because that's a very uncomfortable position but then you become if you speak out you become the strident one the difficult one the one that's always got something to say and people start to back away from you and not come to you to talk to you about things and and that becomes very problematic because um that becomes that becomes very lonely and, it, it, and how, how can we because that that is about in a sense you wanting to step back so it's not uncomfortable but but the challenge to us is we need to be able to cope with uncomfortable and yeah you know so, so um some of that is about us get into a place where we can not be necessarily comfortable with because it shouldn't be comfortable but yeah. allowing the space to to just hear yeah and um, grieve the pain that and sit with that and be uncomfortable by that and and to recognize so you know so i i talk about the rage the pain and the grief mm. and i think there's a very very strong feelings 
as a black woman in in my life uh growing up in this country and so i want you to know that there's pain grief and rage i want you to know that sometimes it makes me burn my own house down and i use that expression in a particular way because i think it's one of the most ex powerful expressions that we've got out of this george floyd moment is that i wanted those young people to stop burning their houses down in america because the trouble with racism is that it makes you self-destruct if you're not careful right. so they go out and they riot they weren't only just young people and they start burning down their environment their youth clubs their community their black businesses and they burn their own house down and i think that's an, an analogy for not just what goes on externally when people are angry and raged in pain is that they start to burn their own personal spiritual physical uh, yeah. emotional houses down and i want people to acknowledge that's what's going on for a lot of black people in this country as well there's this and um, 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 what so <laughs> another thought sorry i have so many thoughts oh, no, i'm brutal. a little bit exhausted <laughs> You know, why, why do so many of us get sick? Why do we get these big diseases, heart, heart disease, uh, diabetes? These are all diseases. A lot of these are diseases of stress. stress it's incredibly yeah. stressful to live in this society. I have an autoimmune disease, I will, I will declare, and I have very severe autoimmune disease. And, um, and, and if you look at the number of people across the world uh, who are black and brown, um, who have autumn it's very very high mm -hmm. and there's something about living in a world that is really stressful trying to not just grind a living uh, uh to try and do some things like i've tried to do in my life and and to stay intact and as a christian you know it should be much easier sometimes to stay intact than it has been and, and i admit sometimes it hasn't um and and i think it has a huge burden of sickness so of course you'll say, well, the reason why so many black and brown people are dying in of COVID-19 in the UK is because they have so many different comorbidities, so many other diseases. But let's look at why they have those comorbidities. Yeah, okay. Let's look at the inequalities of health that are, that, are, that are affecting them. And let's try and work out what the pressures are on this community to try and to, to, to change things um, and, to, and to try and take some of, some of that burden. And so I'm, you know, I I want my I want my vicar to think uh, I need to give my my parishioners or my 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 congregation space to air their upset and and anger and their rage and their grief. Mm. Well, I I don't want it to stop there. I don't no, want no. it to stop there. I want it to. We need to push through and uh, and and have and think about you know what what concretely can be done and this idea of actually unless you are being actively anti-racist yeah. now unless you are doing stuff joining with organizations and and having an anti-racist agenda out there then you're not you're not you're, you're you're actually probably i think being racist you need to actively go out there and, and do stuff out there uh, i think I think that's what's really clicked to my shame that it's not really clicked before. Okay. No, no, but, you know, that, that's what in at the moment, in this moment is, I think appears to be clicking for a lot of people that actually to say I'm not racist is, it's yeah. a not statement, it's a neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just what you're said. And do, do you think, just coming back to some of the stuff around your experience in white majority churches, I, I think, again, I think it was, um, I was listening to Dr. Elizabeth Henry. She made just just this off the cuff comment. I thought, wow, that's really powerful. This that sometimes we 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 settle or we stop for inclusion, and we miss the point that it's meant to be about belonging. Yeah, I, I just thought that was oh, wow. <laughs> I, there is, um, I will find it and I will send it to. You. I'm, I'm actually. It, let me see. I've got it here. Sorry, I never do this kind of thing. <laughs> But I, I'm going to show you this picture. I'm okay. only going to show you this picture because I'm going to send it to you as well. Okay. Um, it's, it's part of a set of pictures of talking about what it looks like. Um, to, so Nina Simone, she sings this, this, this song. I wish, 
uh, and it's about freedom it's about liberation i wish i could know what it feels like to be free and and i love that that song because i just feel that in my lifetime um we do, we have not got i have not got freedom in this country and people will turn around and say for goodness sake connie really you have so much and i you know i'm not an ungrateful woman um, and but i i do think to myself i i I feel so sort of disappointed at this point in my life that the things that I have struggled struggled for, we have not achieved. I've not achieved them for my children and, and now I have grandchildren and what is it gonna be like for them? And so that's really, really, really troublesome for me. And and she's right, because what we go for is is trying to make people feel like they be they belong, but actually it do, you, you don't help people to, you, what happens is that people don't feel they belong. Yeah. They feel they feel pandered to. They feel um, that people aren't. They just feel different all the time. And mm -hmm. I I want to stop feeling different. Yeah. I know I'm different, and I celebrate my differences. Um, you know, I you know if if I'm if you ask me to bring something to a dinner party, I will bring something that's quintessentially me. I might bring I don't think I'll turn up with rice and peas, but I'm, I'll bring something from who I am, and yeah. and and I think that's really important. But actually, I also want the freedom to turn up with a, a creme brulee or a this or something that doesn't represent who I am or people think that I am. I want to be to be me and to be accepted for me in its entirety instead of being anything else so what does what does what i call liberation freedom look like now and um in that that picture i showed you that there are several stages to it and so the first thing is that we think uh there are these three people uh a father and their two, his two sons and they're trying to watch something and and they what they do is they find a box for them to stand up so they can look over mm. and watch the match that's going on and so that's what people think it's all about giving people a box so they can stand up and they can look at the action and then they think oh actually we need to find boxes for more people and then they find more and people can look over it and it's it's not till right at the end that people take away the fence right. and, wow. and and it's such, it's such an important vision. It's very limited still in, in all the rest of it. Um, but it's, it's the moment when people think, actually, what are we giving them boxes for? <laughs> Let's just take the fence down so they can see, so they don't have to stand on boxes. And, and, and that's what it looks like for me. It looks like, um, you know, young black men not being on over, not being unemployed at a greater rate, the young black man not being picked on at school and, you know, told to go into this particular, you know, all that stuff um, that, you know, I'm, I'm not putting everything at the weight of society because I think as communities, we have things to do mm. about the way that we parent and, and love and, and all the rest yeah. of it. But let's look at some of the trauma that, our communities are functioning and I was talking to somebody fairly recently about um, I've started I've a very very gentle toe into a blog around race and church um, which is called salt and pepperhead a uh, woman in the front pew and it's just thinking about uh, a little bit about race and stuff and how far back I am from having parents that was of having relatives that were slaves in Jamaica and it's not very many generations it's not very many generations and and then we haven't even begun to think about the trauma and the repercussive effects of that trauma on our family lives and why it is so hard sometimes to hold our family lives and um, and actually the impact of of church so in in one of the things I wrote about was about how you know my mother came here and my father and they were turned away from churches you mm. know they went they went off to their methodist churches because they're the only people that would let them in yeah, yeah. they they couldn't go to the church of england churches um you know my mum would would have been 90 odd it's just it's so very close that stuff is so very close oh. and uh and and that stuff is still happening you know 
it's still happening where people are in cliques or they're not welcoming or they think they can't understand what people are saying you know it's like really (laughs) you know let's let's kind of move on here um um and then i suppose there's that how do we support people who are like me who are happy to say and talk out and uh, um because there is a burden Mm. on I think it's important if you have a voice to use it but not everybody wants to use it and I think that's also okay but how do we sort of say to people you know come and talk about these things if you want to talk about these Mm. things Mm. and we will hear you um and we will value what you have to say and so you know when I read my poem out in church on black history month of course because i had to have some peg to have a poem like that going on i I say that in my most cynical way uh you know people were blown away by it uh one but i could write it deliver it Mm. it was so um personal um they were so shocked uh and i'm thinking "Mm." And what next? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and actually, it it felt like that just went out into the ether and nothing else happened as a result of it. Mm. And you can't expect people to put their, their necks on the line, their selves on the line, their hearts on the line continually. Yeah. And, yeah. and be, to be no kind of... Not... Uh, I'm not being critical of my churches in my, but you can't expect people to keep giving the giving, doing the, you know, it's, I'm, I am not a gift that gives, keeps on giving. No, no, I'm, no. I'm a gift that needs to be loved, to be cherished, to be valued, to be supported in, in other ways as well. Um, you can't just roll me out to, you know, do my, my bit. Thing, yeah. And uh, because that's what, what's, what's pertinent for the moment sort of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we. Uh, you, I, you sent me. A, you sent me. A, I don't know if it was a letter you were referring to that you're, you're penning, but you sent me a template of um, <laughs> a letter to churches, which you know was just a really, really helpful because you, there is a sense in which it's it's, it's where to start, and I, I think seeing that letter is just let's just start. Let's you know that's the point, isn't it? Let's, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so when, when you when you look at that uh, template. Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot now. Where, where do you think? Where do you think to yourself? I mean, it's I, I, you know, I get the fact that this is overwhelming, it's yeah. overwhelming for everybody, um, and and I, what I love is that you're gonna you're gonna try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so in a, in a way, what does that look like for you in your context as well? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think for me, the, the thing that really struck me was. Um, uh, you referred to it earlier the, the sort of uh, the optics, if you like, and and then beneath that is like, well, it's in a way, it's quite easy to get the optics right <laughs> and miss the whole point of getting it. Like, it's, that's and the, the challenge for me is in in that. So, how as a you know, as a staff team, as a as a PCC, as a leadership team, do, do we? Because it's not just about putting you know people of minority in that. It seems to me, do correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but, but it's how, how do we um, ensure that the barriers w- that we in our white privilege might not even know are there, mm. you know, how do we help people uh, and make the way for people and make it possible for people to, to, to live out their God-given gifts in the positions of leadership that they're called to, but might not be realising, not because... You know, because from our point of view, we might anyone can. Yeah, you know, we say anyone can lead anyone. Like, mm-hmm. but we we maybe just totally naive or haven't want to look or uh, at what what those invisible barriers to us that are there that are stopping people. Mm-hmm. You know, just because we say it, yeah, doesn't mean that people feel they. So there's a it's that unhidden layer that you know I really want to. Uh, that that's what I want to look you know look at with our staff and our PCC, uh, kind of first. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that that for me. Like, yeah, Lincoln's a very you've, you've been here, Lincoln, Lincolnshire. You know, um, it's a very white kind of majority 
place and so it's really easy for us to go well you know we are representative of the culture around us really? yeah the, which is just an easy get out like it's easy and and again challenging that and going well hang on um yeah. you know the picture of the church you know every tribe every tongue every mm -hmm. and, and so it's not just how we representative of the community which i don't think we are fully yet but mm -hmm. but actually how are we going beyond that and modeling yeah yeah modeling that the kingdom that that's the massive challenge for us and i, I think it just starts by opening up these conversations and yeah and and, and, each other. and 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 lincoln is you know quite in terms of its race quite quite uh, undiverse if you want to yeah. mean in a critical way but actually i i think as these as big white majority evangelical churches we have another problem of class going on here yeah yeah um and so um my husband as you know is quite involved in prison work yeah and <laughs> You know, so we're trying to deal with these prisoners that are coming out of prison and um, they're not like us. Now, <laughs> that doesn't mean that middle class people don't go to church. It just so happens that the set of people that we are coming that are coming out of Pentonville in North London are not like the people that go to our church. Yeah. And. And. Um, they're sort of a bit of blown away sometimes by some of the things that we say and we do and our lifestyle and um and i and i have to keep reminding myself you know that they don't live the way that we live so i'm not even talking about no, no. I'm not talking about race i'm talking about class here i'm talking about the barriers to people walking into our churches which is probably why they find it easy to sit on a sofa and look at our screens that make us think um we we we, we want to be part of this and not part of this church and i, I think my some of my reflection of that have been it's it's really easy for us to to be doing social um social welfare mm -hmm. and, and think we're uh we're doing social justice or social yeah. it's, not, it's yeah. not the same thing and yeah. We, we've got a you know we've got a massive unused muscle as a church i think yeah uh, yeah you know in that um, social action social justice piece we and and also the um the idea that um you know as you identify people you go on and you identify people and you think okay maybe that person can do that and maybe that person can do that the journey that you take them on to um to get them there um so you know you may you may have a somebody like me who's done a lot of speaking and and they can just do it but actually somebody else may need a bit of time and um who's going to put that time in to look at their talks or to look at whatever they're doing and making sure the the mentoring that needs to go on in those kind of situations actually just set people up to fail and then that's horrible it's horrible for the people who have to see it and and even worse for the person who ha has has to do it um and um and that's really problematic because um we kind of want everybody to come out of a tradition of being confident well educated being able to to to, to do all those things and, and and it's not where people are coming from and yet so many people can can grow and learn and do if you if you walk the road with a bit with them but it takes well, it takes time it takes a bit it takes a bit of effort you know yeah yeah <laughs> that's um, i still been so i mean my brain always hurts after speaking to you <laughs> Connie. It's, it's so helpful and i'll, I'll that's yeah, right. um, I know you really, 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 yeah i know you need to go on and stuff so but no, thank you if, okay. Connie, if you were gonna just take your gloves off and just leave us with one kind of challenge as, as out there as you want um in, in a way that's going to be yeah, what, what would that be? What would be a sort of... That's not to trivialise everything you've said to one comment, but it's to say... Love's off, what do we need to hear? Um, I think we have to get ruthless about time frames and, 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 and action. And so it, I'd like to think um, when I next 
that let's just make it just between you and I. The next conversation I have with you when I hopefully next can see you and your family after lockdown is what have you done? Yeah. And not what have you done this month and what you've done in two months' time, what's in three months, what's your year plan, what's your six month plan, what organizations are you involving yourself with? What um what links are you making into other communities and other churches that are unlike you that you could support that you know can come day tripping out to those wonderful gracies of yours nearby or you know it's 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 all those kind of things what are you what are you doing to situate yourself in this country in this moment of a very diverse country and reaching out to to different countries so i don't want i don't care if you failed um, I would like to think, let's pray and really ask God and, and Holy Spirit to anoint the stuff. But I just think sometimes you just have to get out of the boat. Yeah. And, um, and so I want, to, I want to know from you and from anybody else who's thinking, what have you stepped out of that boat to do? Because uh, it's too easy to sit, sit there and do nothing and to say, you know, to be what we call wooden tops, to nod away saying, yes, 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 I agree with everything that's going on and it's really awful. But what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, and it's, and it, it's got to be thoughtful. You know, it's got to be smart. It's got to be all those things that we know about how to do things. Yeah. Don't just go crazy and say, we're going to have lentil dal every week because we're all going to go vegetarian. You know, don't, don't, you know it's, got to, <laughs> it's got to be integrated in your lives as a church and as a family. But it's also got to really, you've got to stand up and step out the boat. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's, that I think is, is where the courage is really. Um, because I think if you stand up and step out of the boat, two things will happen. You know, you'll either walk on water or you'll drown. <laughs> and, but actually, um, you won't drown. You just think, oh, let me get back in and think about how to get out again. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you don't do it, um, it, it seems to me that the, particularly in our churches, we're so invested with being part of the establishment and being the establishment that it's uh, we're, we're almost frightened to do anything now, and that's a real pity. Yeah. Um, so do something. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I look forward to seeing you at that time we can see you again and the. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and always, you know, come back to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much, Connie, for sharing that. I, I recognise there's a, you know, there's a cost to you sharing all that as, as well. So really, really appreciate it. Um, no worries. the truth 